here you go, sir. And uh, you brought one yourself. You brought a t-shirt. And uh, the first one I seen was uh, where you were making homemade black gunpowder. Oh yeah. Wow. It's gotta be one of my favorite ones yeah. still. Like it's amazing. moment I have is where you got the, the gunpowder that you made yeah and then you got the the gun and you went through that whole process but then you captured the moment of the first fire yeah. in slow motion yeah and I'm like yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I, I probably squealed like a little girl oh, yeah. and <laughs> meanwhile, awesome my little moment. girls are standing there very stoically and, <laughs> yeah You can learn this stuff. That's why I said it's like the golden age of off-grid homesteading. It's like you can do it. The information's out there. And our channel is not a resource channel. Like we are not step-by-stepping anyone. But I feel what we are trying to do is encourage people. Like you, you, you're watching us do this for the first time and it's pretty darn successful. It was like I did not grow up, you know, milking cows or building houses, you know, fixing my own vehicles or whatever. Well, we're good. We're on? We're, we're live on now. Air? Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, we are on air. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Kevin Unscripted. Well, thanks. We're talking about a gift here. Yes. <laughs> here you go, sir. And uh, you brought one yourself. You brought a t-shirt. Yeah. And uh, we got a bunch of other stuff from you guys the last time you were kind of in the area, uh, which we use daily. Yeah. Like what, uh, the, well, the coffee scoop? There is a coffee scoop, yeah. And then uh, Jody got, what did he get, Jody? He got a purse. We got a bunch of hats. Oh, the salad tongs. Oh, yeah. Which are pretty the, cool because they smell like they're from Mexico. Like, oh, what yeah. kind of wood is that? Like, uh, I think it was Palo Blanco. Nice. Which is like white wood. It, white it's a hardwood, tree, though, isn't it? Yeah. They're all, it's either cactus or hardwood down there. It's kind of what we. That sound. would have taken quite a while to uh, carve out because that is like, it's pretty tough stuff. Yeah. And it, we broke, uh, we got one of those silky saws, which are magical. They can basically cut down anything except those hardwoods, man. Oh, uh, we ended up like, they just got hot and we broke one. And then we had, we had friends visiting. They had to pick us up a new silky blade and bring it down. Cause yeah, we'd never encountered that kind of hardwood up here before. Especially you're cutting down some old dead thing. It's probably been baking in the desert for like 40 years. <laughs> yeah. It's like iron. Yeah. Well, what's a silky saw? Uh, I don't know. It's silky, hand, it's like Swedish saw? or something. But it's a, is it a hand Maybe saw? Maybe it's Japanese. Yeah, it's a little flip out saw. Oh, And yeah. we got one that's like super aggressive. Like you could defend yourself against a grizzly bear with that thing. Ooh, if nice. he stood still. If he stood and he just yeah, let you go. You just... <laughs> <laughs> Cord room. <laughs> well, a polite bear. We might come across yeah. one of those one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't we introduce you? Okay. Um, you've got uh, a pretty cool YouTube episode or YouTube channel. And I got to do a shout out to um, Kevin Simigrad, who kind of got me on uh, your channel. Mm -hmm. And uh the first one I seen was uh, where you were making homemade black gunpowder. Oh yeah, wow! It's got to be one of my favorite ones yeah. still. Like it's amazing. But you've you've hammered off. Like I went on a that bit of a binge. That video keeps tracking too. It's just like I everyone can imagine. Loves that. I don't well, know. Well, and then there's that moment where you uh, you got a Cabela's fifty cal flintlock gun. Yeah. And you you got you made it uh, from scratch. You put it all together yeah. and you blued it and everything. Yeah. And then my most the favorite moment I have is where you got the the gunpowder that you made. Yeah. And then you got the the gun and you went through that whole process. But then you captured the moment of the first fire <laughs> yeah. in slow motion. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I probably squealed like a little girl. Oh, yeah. And then <laughs> meanwhile, awesome my little enough. girls are standing there very stoically. And, <laughs> yeah. Quiet it's satisfaction. Nice. Yeah. Me. I'm just squealing. Yeah. All, all the energy eh? in the background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, there's they're cool. I mean, there's a whole array of different uh, episodes. I mean, I went like I said on a binging uh, oh, yeah. watch thing. The gold rings and oh, yeah. let me tell you. So, 
I'll kind of give uh, the listener a bit of an overview. Um, Jeff, also married with uh, Rose uh, Birkinshaw. So uh, the two, I guess, is a family of seven. Mm -hmm. So along with your five daughters and their names, Christina, Julia, Abigail, uh, Kezia. 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 Yeah. Oh, sorry, Kezia. I'm sorry, Kezia. <laughs> Uh, and then Sarah, yeah, family behind a popular YouTube channel, uh, Gridlessness, and uh, they're living on their self-built, eco-friendly homestead. They embody a unique blend of adventure and sustainability. Their story is a testament to living a uh, fulfilling life away from conventional norms, focusing on debt-free living, self-education, and a deep connection to the environment. Their daily adventures include everything from D DIY projects to natural living skills and offering a glimpse into the life of less ordinary. Does that kind of encapsulate a little bit about what gridlessness is about? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're, we're off grid homesteaders in, in like a single phrase. And it's interesting about the eco thing. Um, we've never described ourselves that way. Like I'm not, like much of an eco warrior or anything, mm, but but yeah, I guess the term, the way the eco part that I kind of thought of, like mm -hmm. when it when it's trying to uh, talk, like explain what that means is, yeah. I think almost by default living off grid, and it's not necessarily living off grid in a way where you're going to a point of, like, back two hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. It's just I think sustainability that is a little bit more efficient as far as the you still have power, you still have an ecosystem, but it's a little bit more, I think, efficient and purposeful. Yeah. And I think the like I'm an outdoorsman. Our whole family enjoys the outdoors. Like we live in the woods. Uh we hunt and fish. And I think naturally we want to preserve that environment. Like that's where we're coming from is like we have a love for the natural world and we generally want to take care of it mm. which i think is like a slightly different perspective from maybe more mainstream uh like eco i don't know philosophies <laughs> no fair enough like you're yeah, that's kind of a tricky one. We could just pull that right out of the description, I guess, eh? <laughs> well, no, no, it's it's actually an interesting point because I like I'll spend a ton of like I there's things about our modern lives. Like we grew up normal in the suburbs, so I I totally understand the normal life, but we have been living quite different for quite a long time. Like our kids have been born and raised off grid. And it you know, a lot of things about our lifestyle are very simple and quite a bit different than suburbs and but i i know there's still like so much garbage actual garbage yeah in our lives you know you buy something and all this packaging and it's all plastic and i rack my brain i'm like what can i do with this plastic like I, it's hard not to get it and i'm like can i recycle and then you you think about it. it's like it's like an actual real problem like what are we doing with all this plastic like i can't deal with it as like a homesteader like i don't have a machine to yeah you can't burn, burn it, it or cleanly. nothing yeah uh, you know, on an industrial scale, they can do that, but no one likes the idea of it. And so what what do we do? We like ship it overseas and then they throw it away. So I'm super aware of some of those things. Like, and I'm trying to reduce, um, you know, like my nemesis is I hate buying fuel to run a generator for my backup power. We're solar powered, but we need to run a backup Jenny in the winter. And it just... It just like hurts me to buy <laughs> fuel because it's not off grid if you have to go to a gas station and buy fuel. Well, and I, you know, if solar can do it, like solar's got its own footprint, but at the same time, solar panels can last like 50 years. Like they can last a long time and harvest otherwise unused energy off your roof. And, but gas, yeah, so I'm just trying to like wean ourselves off the gas somehow. And yeah, that's kind of tricky. It is for sure because uh, that rabbit hole. How far do you go? Like, I mean, you you can get into where, like, you're pretty much living like nomads, where you're making your own your own uh, clothing, and you're completely like no solar panel. Yeah. Like, you're going right down to so, like how the country was almost founded, right? Where you're kind of living off the land in its entirety. Yeah. And so, how do you? Where is that line of sustainability? You know, on certain levels that you want to 
keep? If you follow the popular idea of self-sufficiency, which we've totally, you know, especially a decade ago or two decades ago, we really had that idea, like, I want to be totally self-sufficient. And it sounds awesome. But then once you start doing a lot of it, you're like, wait, if I follow this to the end, I will be a caveman. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. can't be self-sufficient without relying on other stuff made by other people. Yeah. Uh, it, unless you go full caveman, because you can use sticks and rocks and live in a cave. But anything else <laughs> involves a tool made by someone, it involves a metal that involves a mine and a smelter and a refinery and a truck to transport it to you. Absolutely. So like if you want to live on firewood, which we do, um, you need a chainsaw and an ax at least. Yep. Right. Or a, I mean, a handsaw, but still you need like a metal blade and man, you would burn through blades. So, so we've... I don't know, a long time ago, kind of forgotten the, you know, like the armchair idea of self-sufficient. Yeah. And we've adopted an idea that's like, no, we don't want to be self-sufficient. We just want to be way more self-sufficient than we would be living in the city or the suburbs. Yeah. And, and if you want to go, I think the realistic uh, target for self-sufficiency is self-sufficiency within a community. And, and I mean, actually like a local community, like someone, you know, people within a few miles of your place, and then you could achieve much higher rates of self-sufficiency, but to do it all on your own is, it's not really possible unless you're crazy and you end up like a caveman. Well, that's just, I think where the process it's, it's not doable. Yeah. If it was doable, we've lost too many um, skills because if it was doable, People who go for a hike, uh, you know, on a nature walk that end up getting lost, it usually end up dying and search parties are called off within a week, you yeah. know, or two at max. So, but that's, a, that's, I think, where the dependency on just where we are in the sustain, you know, the lifestyle that we live has kind of replaced skills that were a necessity of survival with um, niceties. And you got to figure out where do you fit in that on dependency on the niceties and then learn in that process of becoming a little bit more less dependent on all of those. And how do you sustainable uh, sustain the things that you consider to be um, needs or, you know, the, the things that you got to have to be able to maintain a standard of living. So that's usually different for, for everybody. Some people like that was actually one of the questions I was going to talk about um, later, you know, luxury versus, uh, you know, necessities, you know, mm -hmm. some people can't cook without a microwave. Right. You know, they're, they're, that's to them a necessity. Uh, but then if you want to take the microwave away, you need to learn a skill to be able to offset that. Right. So cooking. Yeah. Well, now you're on a stove. So do you want to take the stove away and use wood? Well, that requires more of a skill set and application in that whole process of trying to make that possible. And then at what length do you want to go down that chain, I guess, yeah. is... Is, is kind of an interesting, I guess, question per person. Yeah. Well, man, there, you said like five a different there, things eh? I want to. <laughs> I put a notepad there for you. I have an opinion you. of. <laughs> so one of them is you mentioned the skills and we yeah. have lost tons of skills. Yeah. And that I do believe is a shame because I don't know. I think that A, skills can, if you have skills in something, you can offset cost and expense and waste just by having a skill, you know, you can build something yourself or you can fix something yourself, or you can achieve some result without just paying money for a new product yeah. of some sort. And, you know, it's only, we're only like one, you know, we're two generations away. Like my grandparents, they homesteaded, they were off grid before it was called off grid. They just didn't have power. And and so they had a ton of skills, like they butchered all their own animals and they hunted and they cut down trees and made firewood and they, they dug their own well, like they were very capable and had skills. So I think skills are awesome and we've lost it and replaced it with just our wealth. Like we're super wealthy and we can buy everything Absolutely. and we don't need a skill. Yeah. But I think that if you think, if you look from outside perspective on society, that's probably not a good thing to just rely on our wealth because the wealth comes with huge costs. Whereas skills, not only can they avoid costs and waste, like, like 
you know, resources that didn't need to be cut down or mined up. If you have skills, you can reuse things, rebuild things, do things yourself. But also they're like rewarding yeah. for our spirit. Absolutely. Like if you are productive and if you create something or build something, like that's what drives well, a Well, there's a connection and it's almost primal in some ways, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, two totally different things, right? Yeah. You look at like, you know, the cost of living and the quality of living aspect and the cost to society of like, you know, our purchasing, um, you know, purchase our ways out of out of challenges or into comfort or whatever. But then you also look at the very, very personal aspect of like, you know, you're, do you, f are you like healthy in your mind and in your soul because you're productive? You know, you, you work hard and you're productive. To me, that's like the best life for someone. But people don't realize how uh, intertwined those two elements are, really are. Yeah. I don't think people, and that's why you see, you know, mental health now seems to be, become a more and more common uh, thing. But to kind of touch on, I think, uh, skills. There is a connection when you when you learn a skill to be able to do something for yourself, a sense of accomplishment, and totally. there's a, there's a mental health aspect to it. But to offset um, skills, it's all about I think, or a large part of it is time management, because for you to be able to accomplish a thing, let's go back to maybe say the cooking thing, one person might be able to uh, you know feed themselves through a microwave, and it's a very efficient, yeah. effective way to be able to you know heat up your food whereas if your if your values and your sense of accomplishments and and morals and principles kind of side a little bit more with the satisfaction and happiness and going to the bush cutting down a tree uh, you know and, and then harvesting all of that and, and piling it up to a point where you got to feed it to a wood stove so that you can cook and then gather the ingredients to be able to accomplish the same exact task. It's a completely different. So you're trading your time yeah. for skill and a little bit of an independency from that, but not. So how do you manage? Like those are really weird elements to try and manage. Right. And so you think about it this way and uh, I don't know, you can think about this a hundred different ways, but I thought of this the other day is like, you know, on one hand we have, we, we spend a lot of effort and time trying to save money and save time. Yeah. So like we could buy some cheap food and put it in a microwave and we've saved time and money. Good. But now what are you going to do with the time and the money? You could pay for Netflix and then watch like a vegetable yeah. Netflix. Okay. That's one option. Or you could have taken more time and more money. So like hunting, we, we hunt all our own, we hunt or fish and raise all our own meat for our, our entire married lives, 24 years. And, you know, it doesn't really save money. Like if this were, uh, you know, a zombie apocalypse, at, you know, and we started right now, yes, it would save money because we can use one bullet and hunt one animal and feed ourselves for a year. But overall, like it takes a lot of time to hunt. A lot of times you just go, it ends up being a walk in the forest, right? Yeah. And you didn't harvest anything. Yeah. And, you know, you buy hunting gear. And so that's expensive. Absolutely. And yeah. then, so that takes a lot more time than buying something pre-made. Then you bring it home. And like you said, we have a wood cook stove. So you're, you, you know, you, you cut down a tree, you stack in the woodshed, the girls go out and split it into little kindling pieces for the wood stove. And Rose works on the wood stove for an hour or two and she makes a meal. And so you say, okay, you spend all your time and money getting that food and then preparing it. And then you don't have any extra time or money to buy Netflix and watch it. But compare those two. Like, which one was more healthy and more fulfilling? Well, the second, because, and this is probably just through the conversation and where my perspective would be, would, would be the second because the um, offsetting measures that went with that whole process you just described incorporated what you're talking about with community. So that could be just a family unit. But there's that connection and interaction with other people that, all together make that thing happen. And then you're sharing experiences. So that quality of time that everybody's trying to, yeah. uh, you know, accomplish and, and incorporate into their daily lives. And then also, um, more importantly, really, I guess, the understanding and the appreciation of what it took to be able to put all that together. So there's a sense of accomplishment, respect, uh, connection, bonding, like all these elements that we 
have split down into different points to try and address those things that we feel are important in our lives that are missing. So you go camping with the family to be able to, you know, have family time yeah. and then that connection of with the environment and, and nature and all of that. Whereas, because that's been, that's kind of been removed from our daily, you know, our day-to-day -day life, right. especially if you're in a city center. I mean, and you've accomplished all those other elements that you were able to achieve by going to work and, and selling really your time. Yeah. Developing a skill to be able to sell your time that's got value to generate money to provide other things that give you apparently more time and freedom. But yeah. it's a different form it's a vicious cycle in a different way now you're a slave to something a little bit different aren't you yeah and and i guess that's the thing is what do you want to be a slave to because if you if you live like a typical employee um you know i go to work nine to five for someone else to achieve their objectives you can evaluate like how how much job satisfaction do i have like am i producing something i'm proud of and that i'm passionate about and then you can say, and does that fit my lifestyle? Or are you working too much? Like, are you trying to achieve some great, awesome career goals? But, you know, it is kind of like you are sacrificing your relationships at home. And then you say, I've got a mortgage because I have to live in this city and it's expensive. So now mm -hmm. I've got a mortgage and I kind of feel sometimes, you know, maybe I feel like a little bit stuck. Yeah. And boy, I hate commuting. And now I got to, you know, I got to commute an hour. And so like I lived that lifestyle and I've seen it and I've got lots of friends and family still in that lifestyle. But on the other hand, you know, you're, you're still, it's not about not working, but it's about doing different kind of work that is maybe more satisfying, Absolutely. healthier, yeah. like back to the hunted meal and home cooked, uh, it's healthier. I don't care. Like it say. is. It's healthier. It's, and I think most people food. are starting to realize that. Yeah. For sure. And like, you know, the food that you can buy, like all the processed food, which I think more and more is terrible. It's, it's just like lots of salt and sugar, which our bodies crave. But at the end, you're like, you know, it's not that interesting. It's all just sweet and salty. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then you actually explore like the textures and the more subtle flavors of like more more wild or natural or raw foods. And once you stop being used to like acclimatized to like the incredible salt and sugar content of processed foods, you're like, man, this stuff is like really unique. Like a huckleberry, which most people have never eaten, like a wild huckleberry is like, <laughs> it's a totally unique thing and yeah. it's wonderful. And I, you can't fake that. No, I just watched a, a video last night of where you guys thought you're plucking huckleberries and it turned out to be so, something oh, a yeah. bit different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah careful with your berry identification <laughs> oh man like i sorry i had to i couldn't help it i had yeah. to i had to give I a reason why i'm currants. giggling over it those were currants <laughs> well were they those weren't huckleberries yeah. man you 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 powered through that <laughs> oh yeah well currants have like a bite to them yeah. and so and we don't have a lot of them so like we're not finely tuned to like is this a current or is this like a really poisonous thing? I'm well, not sure. The soap description. I was yeah. like, oh, okay, I know what you're talking about, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But not to kind of degress because yeah. you're actually on a very important um, point that you're making as far as, you know, the, t the time thing. And um, I've kind of touched on that a little bit because we live on land also. Yeah. And I guess the thing that I'm trying to figure out, like a lot of different people is... Um, trying to address that balance but in a different way because i have a sense of appreciation for the, the the land that i live on and being outdoors and so our priorities have shifted from instead of a, a bigger home to something a little bit more simple and then focus on more the outdoor stuff and then the outdoor stuff takes a little bit more time but there's a freaking insane amount of maintenance that goes with you know acquiring yeah. everything you need to to keep that going so you know, one of the focuses I've made is I'll spend twice as much money and three times more time if I got to address one thing only once instead of it becoming an annual um, maintenance issue. Because at a certain point, <laughs> your whole life is just maintaining, right. uh, you know, the things that you have. Yeah. So where wh what do you like? That's a tricky well, hole, like that rabbit hole we started with. Like, where do you, does each person fit in that level? Well, I think 
we're we're in the golden age of like off-grid homesteading if anyone's ever wanted to build a cabin in the woods and just like get out of the rat race now is the time you know my grandparents they just like got by right and of course true they they, like worked hard they like worked land for the first time right and they had a couple animals and you know they were tough i would say and they had they they the skills they didn't already have they they learned and they became skilled and right now we are way wealthier than they were but you can look at wealth in two ways you can say we got more money but you can convert that to time like that's what we've done and we've said you know what we don't need to work full time if we're not like stuck in like a little system of like a super expensive house and a super expensive mortgage and I'm so busy that I have to buy all my food at a restaurant. And like, you know, that's a cycle that you can be stuck in. And we got out of there. And if you take like the full leap, and we get to talk about this, but like the gap in between the two is actually the big problem. Most people can't see how to survive. That transition, that gap. Yeah. for sure. But once you're there, in our experience, it's like, you know what? We are the wealthiest people in the world ever. Yep. Like I agree. I, I do mean, agree. we're we live better in our little cabin than King David or King Solomon. Like we have we have water, we have electricity, we have so much comfort. Like we yeah. got a Blaze King wood stove. The thing is, it's like so cozy. So okay, so but back to the point was homesteading and this off grid kind of lifestyle, living in and closer to nature. It's as easy as it's ever been. We have like really cheap and affordable solar power systems, right? We have, we what we have now in communication is a huge deal. Like if you wanted to be in the woods before, you really had to be a hermit. Yep. You know, you really had to be able to be out there by yourself for a long time. Well, now like you can have a Starlink or a cell phone. Absolutely. And yeah. you can be connected. So you can stay in touch with friends and family, but you can also Google something like, Because we need to get these skills from somewhere. Like, my grandparents are gone. I can't learn from them directly anymore. So, yeah, I got to learn from my online community. Or my very, you know, right now, it's a pretty darn small local community that's doing similar things. And so we have the, the money, and you can convert that into time. And so this isn't the struggle. Like, some people think you have to, like, trade in, like, a cushy job, and then permanent you know be fixing fence 16 hours a day and milking a cow you know the other eight hours a day and you know and it has to slave away like it's 100 years ago and it's like that's not the case remember we're super wealthy now so you can get skills easier you can do things differently and it doesn't have to be a massive struggle and what that leaves you time for is to pursue a passion like i think we should always aim to be working but like Aim to work in an area that you're skilled in or that you feel you're giving value or that you are productive in. And that's what we're trying to do. And I don't know. I can't imagine doing it the old way. No, but you, it's, um, you, you hit on something important with that whole transition piece. Yeah. Because a lot of people do live in this day and age at a point where they feel like it's pretty much just keeping your head above water. Or yeah. even if you're... The other thing, I guess, is uh, if, let's say, you're you know, blue collar or middle class or even Mm -hmm. slightly above, and you're not, you know, keeping your head above water still to make that transition. How do you do that? Because you're giving up certain things that you've come accustomed to enjoying, like let's say a furnace that has a thermostat that checks in all by itself when you're in the middle of sleep at 40 below. (laughs) Well, then (laughs) you you don't truly appreciate the warmth. Exactly. Well, exactly. (laughs) But to, to, to make that transition, you know, that sacrifice that, there there's different it's tough to do because you're right in another point that you make and i'm glad you kind of mentioned it too is because it is a lot more feasible now uh compared to you know previous generations with youtube for example yeah. giving you the ability to learn in a very short period of time remotely yeah um and if that's really what you want yeah as far as that lifestyle and you're you're seeing the value in you know live in that lifestyle it is far more achievable now but there's one other thing i think the culture is missing yeah is application you need to you need to actually commit you need to be able to act uh, growth is in the realm of uncomfortable and so if you get uncomfortable and learn something and 
have the persistence to be able to follow it through. Yeah. That's a hard thing to do, but you can still accomplish it. And I think you, you, I mean, really, we all want to be uncomfortable. We just don't know it. What we talk about is like, we want adventure or we want challenge in our life. And, you know, that's why people go on, you know, that's why we climb Everest. And that's why yeah, we, that's, that's why we, yeah. you know, paddle across the channel or whatever you know, and so that's why the fairgrounds are so popular when they come to town. Eh? It's adventure. Well, it's yeah, that people want like to be a little bit scared, yeah. and people want to be challenged, and we want to overcome it. It's just that we rarely actually do it. We want to experience it, so yeah, we go on a ride or we watch it on tele. Like, man, we don't have a TV, but I'm aware of some of the shows out there, and <laughs> yeah. and I know people love watching people like almost dying in the wilderness. Like these yeah. are TV shows that have been Alone. going on for a long time, right? Alone it's like, example. oh, this guy's going to die. And so really that's an inherent desire of people to like adventure, discover, overcome a challenge. And so we should look at it and be like, I'm glad there's going to be some challenges. Yeah, I'm glad there's going to be some uncomfortable times. And I've always said, <laughs> you know, until you've been really uncomfortable, you don't, you can't really enjoy like a warm, dry comfortable bed until you've been on like a lumpy wet tent floor yeah. you know with a deflated <laughs> thermo rest yeah. and 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 once you've done that for a, a week and then you come home man like the level of joy in your heart when your house gets warmed up and Absolutely. you lie in a comfortable bed so it just makes life better when you get to experience the challenges so I think people should say, yeah, I hope there's challenges because odds are you're going to overcome them and then you're going to have great satisfaction. You, well, people, people, um, I think get too used to like being uncomfortable is something that nobody really wants. And, and that's where I think even like what we're talking about earlier, being able to accomplish certain things, there is that sense of appreciation after you've gotten uncomfortable and you've put yeah. that effort in. And uh, you're right. I mean, nothing tastes better than anything after you haven't eaten for three days. And, yeah. you know, all those all those really uncomfortable moments that you have a better appreciation for. But that's bonding also. It has overlap in a bonding with other people that are sharing those same experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So, so about that, like we've been thinking lots about how to, you know, so our girls are getting older now. So our oldest is married with two kids and you know a couple of the other girls like there's only two in school still and so they're at that age where they're all like leaving or they're gonna leave and we think about the future of course rose is like the quintessential mother she loves these kids till the end and it makes her sad to think about them like being far away yeah, and, yeah. you know and i'm you know more like typical guy like yeah hey like get out of here and go <laughs> yeah. like make your own life and yeah. yeah of course we love you but like go make your own life right and then hopefully what we both want is to have a a, a long lasting relationship absolutely so we want to yeah. be part of their lives and part of the grandkids and great grandkids and all that stuff and what we've thought about <clears throat> is the way i think maybe the best way to ensure a long lasting relationship with the kids is if we actually have common interests and common experiences. So if we like right now, we all enjoy hunting together and fishing and, you know, horse horseback adventures and maybe to a lesser extent prospecting I don't know if any of the girls really love that, <laughs> but you know what I mean? You don't need to enjoy doing everything together, but if you could enjoy doing certain things together, that'll bring you together for the rest of your life. Right. Because really once they become adults, you kind of have to like let the parent child relationship, I feel like die and then rebuild like an adult to adult relationship. Mm. I think um, something as a parent that I, I, I came to realize a little bit, I guess, to speak to what you're talking about is that separation that when you when you do that transition from where they're living at home and and you're sharing those experiences yeah. and you're trying to instill um, values and, and skills and understandings, 
when that transition happens where they're now trailblazing their own life and you want to step in so bad yeah but then they take the skills and understanding of what you taught them and they're able to make decisions and accomplishments for themselves without you having any kind of input in it yeah that's i think describing what the sense of pride in your children is yeah it's fighting that urge and then letting them fall yeah being there if needed but i mean figuring out what that even looks like because then when they develop that skill and that uncomfortable i guess experience that they're trying to overcome yeah at least you gave them the tools and the presence of mind to be able to figure it out and now they've accomplished something for themselves and that's the only way to have any kind of longevity i think that's passing it on from one generation to the next yeah and and the sense of pride so when you say i'm proud of you yeah and i never realized that like when i'd accomplished something they'd be oh i'm proud of you i was like well what the fuck? what do you like what does that even mean yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but you 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 get i think start to understand that as a parent so yeah. i think that's what you're you're kind of describing is it's a different experience but then also there's a sense of satisfaction and pride that goes along with that too watching them you know become adults and successful in their own right well and that it's really kind of the you know it's kind of the i don't know the the proof is you know you look at something if it bears good fruit right and so if your kids if you see your kids making good decisions you know decisions that benefit themselves and their their friends and their family and then as a parent you're like you know what i must have done some things right yeah so some of it might be almost just like self-congratulatory <laughs> oh for sure and, and then the There's... other part is you know truly just being thankful that you know you want good things for your kids so well that's yeah. allowing them to be their own people like the sense of pride and yeah. watching them make right decisions for themselves is also where they're their own person and that accomplishment is theirs but the same kind of also is on the it's a double-edged sword we just don't know which side is sharpest you know in, in, in any, any given moment is yeah. what if they made a bad decision yeah and they're making bad life choices um against maybe things that you taught them that they know better against well it's not really for you to have to bear yeah. there's a sense of guilt that's probably on the level of pride you know on the yin and yang yeah. part of it but that is something up to them to own for themselves yeah uh, uh, even though you kind of did the best in that moment to try and give them set them up for the best you know of success for life but that's a that's a weird one i think a lot of people grapple with as parents well i think the heart i don't know tell me if i'm wrong i think one of maybe the hardest things uh for a parent who like like i think everyone has like something they would they may or may not call it religious but like something some things they believe in so strongly right whether it's an ideology or an or an actual like traditional a moral religion compass or faith kinda. or a belief or yeah. whatever yeah um to to really believe that your kids will decide that for themselves right and and i think if you, you know you or someone else is in a religious community and then you see your kids either choose to follow that faith or to reject that faith like i think that is incredibly hard for parents to to like basically let their kids make that decision so in the parent you know that's like a fundamental core of their life they could never imagine like rejecting their own faith and to see their kids do it would would be you know it'd be like the worst thing ever yeah. and yet I think you have to believe that your kids are truly independent. Like, you know, you instill a lot in your kids for sure. And you can set them up for success or failure. Like there are good parents and bad parents. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And that has real world implications for your children. But at the same time, those really, really kind of fundamental beliefs like faith, religion, or ideology, Instilling I think you have to believe morals the kids. and principles is, I think, what you're talking about there a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but so so, but on one hand, like instilling, yeah, morals and principles is is like one aspect of it. But like, I guess to let your kids actually choose like their own path when it comes to not just 
principles, but like their actual like faith, religion, or ideology. I think that's super hard for any yeah. any parent, no matter what you think your your thing is. Uh, but I do believe it's true. And you have to like let it go. You have to totally let it go and be like, that is, you know, I raised that child, but that's over now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I've kind of like done my job. Yeah. And now I can hope and pray for that kid. But like it's up to them. They're their own independent person. Yeah. Okay. I You're warned right. you I was gonna talk about faith and religion. Yeah. I'm <laughs> Well, and I can, I can, I can definitely relate on like, I, I was grow I was raised in a very uh, structured home when it came to, to faith and you know, Christian, like my yeah. parents, they're part of the move. Yeah. If you know anything about that, I mean, I don't know the move. It's the, so I guess a, a, a rough overdraft is, uh, immigrated to Cap or Canada, um, you know, very Christian, uh, grounded in in their faith um and became part of the move because and this is a little bit i guess personal perception is they went through world war ii and that whole immigration part of things and through the cold war and other uh elements that they had gone through there was a real concern about end of the world kind of things coming and who can blame them we still have that even today yeah so a lot of people uh gathered together um and you want to talk about off grid they they bought land you know, a blueberry and evergreen up north on the Alaska Highway and pretty much uh, cleared the, the land and lived, we're talking like old school, you know, built the built the tabernacle and all their, you know, uh, homes, had a community, had horses for plowing and became very sustainable, but had a very religious foundation. Yeah. Um, and that had a lot of real positive uh, things, but then also there was, you know, elements in there that started to a road to where it, it just didn't have a lasting effect. And so you have all different levels of faith and you have all different forms of faith too. I mean, I don't think there's a culture on planet earth that does, doesn't have some form of connection to faith in one form or another. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just yeah. all different names and, and, and beliefs. Uh, it's a, it's a part of um, the fabric of humanity, really. I mean, yeah. we, we, you can't get away uh, from it. So I understand what you're saying when it comes to, what you're talking about, and we can go down that. But I want to kind of speak a little bit more about the element that you're talking about where, um, you know, your your children, you hope make the right decisions and follow similar beliefs, yeah. like what you're talking about. And that is more apparent. Um, I think the last little while, because you start to see fractures within a family unit when um, family members don't end up agreeing on right. certain things. It could be religion or it could be just about a multitude of other things. And and because you don't see eye to eye and share the, that belief system yeah. and you make a decision, you cast judgment that's so harsh that you're, you're outcasting yeah. family members. And that's a, that's a, that's a shame to not be able to like my, my kids both, you know, they've made decisions that I strongly disagreed with. Yeah. But, you know, in that moment, you know, you got to say, okay. And that's what I'm saying. That's like, all I'm good. talking about the, you know, these are the ch challenges that, as a parent that I'm, there's always a challenge in every stage of parenting. And, and that's the one we, you know, that we're, we're keenly aware of at this point is like letting your kids go, let them make their own decisions, let them choose their own path. And, yeah. and you know, the, the whole reason I brought up you know, the, the faith, religion, ideology is that that's maybe the hardest is to let your kids or to acknowledge that your kids will choose their own faith, religion, or ideology. But really that should be the goal. I mean, why would you want your kids to just like accept your faith or religion? Like even yeah. obviously if you believe it, that, you know, if it's, if it's like basically sacred to you, you would obviously want that for your kids. You feel it's the best for you, then you would feel it's the best for your kid. But even if that's true, then you should want your kid to choose it on their own accord, right? I think what it's doing too is showing that there is a lot of value in um, the ability to develop the skill to communicate. And as the communication starts to erode, then you start having that separation and there's nothing more fulfilling then I think having a conversation of respect 
even at a disagreement on yeah. a very on that level with your kids at, where you can maybe disagree but have the ability to articulate to each other and, and it's almost a sense of satisfaction at the end of it all to just say okay we disagree but we got into such a cool conversation that yeah. got into some really it's it's uh it's personal it's an intimate yeah, yeah. identity right well and and i i think the way i view it is you're 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 starting to relate to them as an adult to adult like a, like a new relationship because when you're when you have a kid it the relationship fundamentally is you're in charge of your kid yeah and and thankfully because kids like would die without you being in charge for the vast majority of their life, yeah. <laughs> you know, probably somewhere in that like 13, 14, uh, they could probably make it, but like up till then they'd probably, you know, they'd die of starvation or get hit by a car or something. So, so you fundamentally <laughs> have this parent child relationship where you're in charge yeah, and they kind of do what you say and they should, and they should obey. And, but then there's this transition, which is so fast and it's not even linear. It's, it's, uh, it's exponential where, you know, in 12 years of their, the first 12 years of their life, you know, they gain tiny bits of independence, right? You know, they can start to dress them. You know, it takes them years to go to the bathroom by yeah, themselves, right? And then it takes them like another <laughs> yeah. couple of years to dress themselves. And then, you know, they can prepare a meal after like eight years for themselves. And anyways, but then when they're like 13, 14, 15, whatever it is, yeah. uh, suddenly they go from like 15% independence to 85 percent independence and it ramps up so fast sometimes it's like month to month like yeah. what you should be in charge of in their life today you need to relinquish that control and authority one month from now yeah so and that's why i think it's so tricky with those teenage years it's not because we're all bad it's just that we have a misalignment the kid feels like they're ready for yeah. that responsibility but you don't feel like they're ready and you don't realize how fast it changes, right? Like what Absolutely. you did last year is not cool this year. Like they need to have more responsibility. So you're trying to like constantly feather this like little line of them going from 15% to 85% independence. Anyways, at the end of that parent-child relationship, the way I view it is like, you kind of got to let that die so that you don't have any remnants of like you being in control anymore. Mm. And then reestablish like an adult to adult relationship. And hopefully your kid still respects you because you, you are an elder. So you have more experience and hopefully they can, un, they can see that and recognize it, but it's still like an adult to adult relationship where you have to respect their choices and they respect your choices. 100%. And yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's fundamentally different than the parent child relationship you had for, you know, 15, 20 years. Well, and there's no rule book that you can reference because you have everybody's so uniquely different, especially yeah. with that transition that you talked about. Yeah. To figure that out real time. And then the other thing is that every parent, especially the first one, or the, not the first one, I meant a parent that is raising the firstborn yeah. is learning themselves. Yeah. And so you have two little opposing factors there that you got to kind of manage real time to figure out well, you're making the best decision, you know, with the information you had at the at that moment right. in time. So the second child that you have, or third or fourth, I'm sure you're, you're able to have a better understanding, but you're still playing with, I think, the well, uniqueness except that they of end up each being really different. person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then you also have cultural acceptance, you know, okay, well, maybe, you know, I'm sure some kids can, are very capable of driving at the age of 12. Uh, whereas others, mm -hmm. I don't think I see, you know, 40 year olds that should not be driving. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But then, you know, when it comes to culture and in, in Canada, the definitive line is 16. And now you have to, you know, before yeah. it was get a license. And now you have that whole graduated process. Yeah. Well, that's not really a sweeping response for each and every person. There's yeah. definitely variances on those. Man, this whole. Okay. Now you're making me say it. Yeah, this, I'm pulling it out of you. Well, because now, because you you just <laughs> talked about the government, and now I'm going to talk about oh, the government. And okay. I've been thinking about this lots. And I, for f 40 years, almost, um, I was pretty like, whatever about the government. I didn't, you know, I voted, but I just wasn't. I didn't really care too much. I didn't think too much about it. This last three years, in my opinion, things got totally out of control. Um, and then I started questioning everything. 
I'm like, man, the government controls a lot of stuff. So the driving license, this kills me. Uh, my girls are very responsible. First of all, the girls. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. Uh, boys can be different than girls. 100%. And girls, different girls are different too. But these yep. girls are super responsible. Uh, they've been operating motorized vehicles on our property since they're like eight, right? They start with quads. You know, they they use the the tool cat, the bobcat. Um, they drive the trucks around the property. We're getting firewood. They're operating chainsaws. And so if you ever wanted like a 14, 15 year old kid to drive a car, it would be these girls. And yet our government, all these rules, it's like, no, they can't get a license till they're 16. Then they can only drive with one person for like a year. Well, we have seven people in our family, so that's not helpful. And then for like another year, they can drive, but they have limitations. So they can only drive with one. They can drive with all the family, but only one yeah. friend. And then they yeah. can't drive at night. And we live <laughs> like a, we live in the woods. Like we, there's no public transit. And I mean, even if you don't live in the woods, all you got to do is live in a rural area and yeah. there's no public transit. Like these kids got to drive if they're going to do anything. Absolutely. And like our kids yeah. are ready for life. Like at 16, they're, they're operating a business. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. at 16, they're like, they're gaining a lot of skills. They have like a lot of initiative and no, they can't, they basically can't drive till they're like 19. So anyways, you got me started on the government because, you know, even 20 years ago when we got our driver's licenses, we, we took the test at 16. Uh, we had a learner's period for 30 days and then we had a full license. So basically at 16 in one month, we had a full license, but who regulated our driving? It's our parents, because whether they trusted you to take out their car or not, like Absolutely. almost no one at 16 had they the money to buy their own the car. Absolutely. So it's like your parents should be the best people yeah. to gauge your ability. Yeah. And my parents, for sure, were like, yeah, you can go out and you have to be back, you know, by dark or you can be out or what are you doing? Yeah. Like, where are you going and with who? So parents had responsibility for their kids. And so you made me say it. Now that I'm like questioning everything, like our society and our relationship with government, I'm like, oh, we're just going down this path of bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger government. And what that's doing is like, they are taking more and more and more responsibility. Like now it's the government saying when your kid or when you as a teenager is like ready to drive. Well, the government's terrible at making decisions. First of all, it's the same for every single person. Obviously, that's not correct. Yeah. Some kids are ready way earlier than others. Yeah, exactly. And so you took that away from parents. And then beyond just the parents taking responsibility for their kids, the government takes responsibility away just from every individual. Right? Like, it was the responsibility of people to take care of themselves. And when people have to put, you know, when they have to take care of themselves truly, man, they will be resourceful. Yeah. Like Absolutely. our grandparents were resourceful <laughs> and their neighbors yeah. were resourceful. And when people still failed, like when they were old and crippled and the government wasn't helping them at all, thankfully back then, uh, what happened? Friends did, neighbors did, the community took care of itself. Like they took care of their elderly neighbors. They didn't have like a government funded society because again, who's better to take care of the neighbor? But right now, it's hard for people to see, like, if we were arguing about this, which you're not putting up much of an argument, but uh, <laughs> if we well, were arguing... Not, I, I, I align on a lot of what you're saying. For... I, yeah, I would say, like, individuals are better at making the decision to help their... How to best help their own family, right? Their extended family, their neighbors, and their community. Then the government. Like, the government, what do they do? They just, like, give out checks to everyone. Well, a lot yeah. of people, that's not good for them. Like the money's not actually helpful because the money's part of the problem because the money is funding an addiction. And you can see it in downtown Prince George. People like line up for their check. They get their check immediately, walk like two doors down to the bank. They cash it. And then they walk immediately behind the next building. They buy drugs and inject. It's literally like five minutes later, they're injecting. Now, if that was my friend or family, I would say, you know what? At this moment, the money is not the best thing for you because your struggle 
is just being perpetuated. Yeah. But what's happened is right now, that responsibility has been lifted from us as friends and family and community. And we look at people who are hurting. We're like, hey, you've got like, you know, you've got EI or you've got some sort of government funded program. Like, and it's true. Like, I don't want to necessarily give money to or, or try and offer assistance when someone's already in a program that I fund through tax dollars. So to me, it's kind of like, well, we can't both be responsible. The government has to relinquish responsibility and let local, let friends, family, yeah. and community take care of ourselves. It's so I guess, you that's know, that's how my, this country was my, made. My, that's how the America was uh, made, was people taking care of themselves. Well, okay. Yeah. And I agree. I'm trying to figure out, like this conversation is, uh, is important and I think it needs to be um, talked about more frequently by everybody. <laughs> I'm just trying to, I, and I wanna engage, but I think there's a, a importance to be able to hear what you have to say. Um, and then I'll put, I try and respond yeah. in a healthy way back and forth. I just was letting you talk because <laughs> you are hitting a lot of things that are, I agree with. And, and it's, if you're looking for pushback, uh, unfortunately I'm probably the wrong guy, even though I, I push back quite often. But when it comes to this, um, I do agree that the government, I want to hit on a man, like, you know how I, you had so many things you wanted to respond to what I said at the beginning. Yeah. I don't even know where to start right now, <laughs> I, she, but I will start with, okay. Government too damn big for sure. Yeah. And I'm so on board. Uh, with everything you said with that. And when it comes to the enabling aspect of how government is uh, taking away your ability to be able to uh, be involved in close friends and family, uh, they've made it culturally impossible because who are you and like the, the, the woke yeah. really aspect and yeah. I, it's real, the woke thing. So part of that aspect that I came to realize though is just like yourself, uh, this podcast is the result of me trying to figure out out of anxiety and anger on levels that I didn't know what I could do. And the result was I got to start a podcast because I will literally go crazy. It was affecting my demeanor. Yeah. And I had to figure out how to deal with that. And I felt I'm not a politician, but I'll talk to the ones that are involved. In, and yeah. there was a learning process that I'm grateful for over this whole thing. And I came to realize that in this process, my disdainment with government is well-founded on very, a lot of levels, but I've come to realize that it's our own fault. And you talked about Canada and America. They started, you know, North America out of an extreme need to get out of oppression because of a lot of the dictatorship and overreaching government attributes that we're starting to experience now. And then life got so good that we started to get disengaged over generations. And I think the, the country, and I'll finish, I'll let you respond, but I think this country, Canada specifically, mm -hmm. but North America and our government system is, thank God, for our government and our and our country it's just i think life got so good that a lot of the people a lot of people got, got disengaged and a lot of really wrong people are in government right now and we're starting to realize the impact that's having on us because life got so good and anytime you say screw the government or i'm not going to practice the right and maybe something the voting is so important that veterans paid their life for us to have that freedom and the ultimate disrespect is for us to say to hell with the government let's burn it down and i want nothing to do with yep. it we have to get more involved yeah and in healthy way like get don't get me wrong i got to make sure that people don't freaking light the hair on fire here when i say that <laughs> there is a healthy way of engagement there's getting involved in the schools the healthcare, the government civic duty like there's a, a whole barrage of ways to get re-engaged yeah but we have to saturate the government with more right people instead yeah. of them polling city centers and making man beyond harmful decisions that that affect provinces and countries yeah yeah so <clears throat> like to me fundamentally people have just like gravity is always pulling things down. Uh, I believe that people will are, are drawn to fulfill their own selfish desires. 
Like that's a constant draw, just like gravity. So gravity doesn't mean this cup has to fall to the floor right now, but it means it's trying. Yeah. And if I let it go, it will fall. <clears throat> so same thing with people. If we don't hold on, then we will descend into a quagmire of selfish and foolish desires. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I look at the government, I constantly struggle trying to imagine like an extreme, like what is ideally perfect. I don't actually know what that is. Uh, but, but I always imagine like I, I'm kind of scientific in that sense where I want to know like exactly concretely what is the proper way of government that we should aim for. And on the other hand, trying to be super realistic. It's like, what do I do today? Right. To, to yeah, improve exactly. it. Yeah. And so what I've resolved is that <clears throat> the best thing we can do is a, yes, we need to vote for the good people. And if we feel strongly about a person or a party or a platform or something, we need to like actually spend a few minutes and support it somehow. So absolutely. I'm trying to do a few things now to support what I believe is the right way. But also, I think what we should be aiming for, regardless of the good people or not, is we just need to shrink the government. Absolutely, we need to say yeah. that government will tend to be inefficient, incompetent, and corrupt. It will tend to be that because it's a huge self-serving organization. Right, well, like look, the incentive. Humans, humans by default are exactly. self-serving. Yeah, look let's, at, just, look at, let's just agree on, on that. On every spectrum, look, though, look at look look at people. You're talking about uh, Prince George and some of the issues that are there, and that's right across the board. You look yeah. at that same element in Fort St. John or Dawson Creek or Vancouver, and then you look on the exact opposite at, end of it all. It's self-serving, the elites, yeah. and everything in between. And when you come to realize that humans by nature, our default emotion is hatred and and death i mean if you get yeah. fatigued you're not happy if yeah. you get tired or you're threatened you're not happy it is it's a vicious nature yeah. and when you get into big government um it's overbearing but if you might the way i've looked at it is like what you're talking about earlier survival is key we're tribal so you, you know go off grid you need a small group of people that could be bad I talked about earlier, you know, with uh, with with the move. Yeah, there were bad elements there. Yeah. Now you got to manage those because those same elements um, you know, are magnified when you're in government. Yeah. Or maybe when you're, you know, in any kind of s certain group, and and the self-serving, yeah. destructive element of it all is, I think, universal. Yeah, but you said it. You said magnified in government. Exactly. Yeah. So this 100%. is this is my point. Is I believe that we all have a draw that's basically to destruction yeah <laughs> to self-destruction <laughs> and we just we're drawn to certain things that will destroy us and destroy people around us yeah right and and you see it we people fall into it all the time sometimes it's like addictions that end up destroying families and sometimes it's just you know a selfishness where you choose yourself you choose yourself you choose yourself and then suddenly your relationship with your partners failed and your family split apart and it it does damage right yeah so so we know that people are failure prone but the bigger structure that we build the more we compound the the potential failures so if i fail as a father i i can i can damage my wife and my kids and even my community friends and community Right. That's the extent of the damage. If Justin Trudeau has the same type of failures, he is crushing 40 million people, 40 million families, 40 million communities. Yeah. Like, so all I want to do is say, hey, even if there's a good guy in government, and I do believe that Trudeau is a terrible guy in government, like, I just think he's not wise. I think he's super selfish. Yeah. I personally think he's lying every time he's talking. Yeah. Um, and and so, but even if you have a good person there who's who's maybe wiser, less less selfish, like has maybe a more common view of of people in society than than Trudeau. Like Trudeau didn't grow up a normal person, right? He's got like a pretty skewed worldview based on his upbringing. So even if you had a normal guy there, though, he's got too much power. There's like too many ways for him to easily fulfill 
you know, his, you know, to benefit himself. So I'll give you an example. Say you're the prime minister and you do something stupid. Like you make a mistake because obviously you're going to. Yep. Right. And maybe your mistake is a policy or maybe it's just like a personal life thing or whatever. Well, that's embarrassing. And what do we do if I do something embarrassing? I try not to show other people. Right. Absolutely. I try yeah. not to like display it. I will try to even hide it. Like all, you know, if we make a mistake, we try and cover it up. The problem is like as a, as an individual, again, how, how, what do I have at my disposal to like hide my own failures? I have limited power and resources. If you're the prime minister and you do something embarrassing, uh, you can command all of any of your bureaucrats to cover for you in crown corporations. You, you literally are the boss of the RCMP. You're the boss of the uh, Bank of Canada. You're the boss of the CBC, like the biggest public broadcaster in yeah. Canada. You, you have too much power. You can command cabinet. And right now he is commanding the entire government with his coalition. So the problem is, like, should we be surprised if he does something wrong, if he's caught lying, if he's caught making a silly mistake? Should we be surprised if he just pulls a few strings and and covers it up or conceals it? Or how do you say it? Obfuscates? <laughs> these words. <laughs> I don't know that. You know, these, yeah. It's because we would do it. Like I would try and conceal my well, own we mistakes, would. and so I, I think I think everybody image has a mental image of themselves as Braveheart, you know, screaming at the end of the, you know, f you know, trying to stand up no. for themselves. But you We're know what? You know what? Sh you know what's shocking though? <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of really key moments where I've been like, wow, what is happening here? Yeah, the one of the first, like you cannot dismiss the level of. I don't think there's too many people on planet Earth that would have done what Jody Wilson Rabel did. Right. She went and sacrificed a lot for the intentions of being able to stand her ground on a moral position that wow. I'd say very few people would ever do. And then it was just, it was just, oh, well, that's no big deal. It, it the disappointing part isn't the fact that he did what he did. Yeah. Even though that does have an element. Yeah. The more alarming that, I, that part of it is that we had somebody that had some real spine and moral compass and yeah. principles that we talked about earlier to stand their ground in adversity that I don't think anybody, like, very few of us can relate to. Yeah. And nobody had her back. Yeah. The public, the Canadians did not have her back and yeah. say, look, because we the people should have had enough power to say, look, this has got to go unchecked. And then that enabled, I think, it to be normalized to where you've seen a lot of other things just happen more frequently to the point it was like, oh, well, you know, he's just gone. Like yeah. Justin Trudeau is done so many things right now that if a yeah. normal human being yeah. did what he just did, yeah, there would be, I don't know what would happen, but it would not be good. Like, no. I mean, we're talking criminal things yeah. that are not good. So, so how do you, how do you stop that? Well, I think all you like to me, it's damage control. Like you have to just make the government smaller. You have to give them less control. Like for one, I'm very interested in this proposal to defund the CBC. I love it. They just got a whole pile more. Though. I know, but that, <laughs> the, yeah, they're not the plan by the liberals. Yeah. The, the plan by the opposition is to defund the CBC. Yeah. And I love it because it's hilarious. The money they just gave them. They said they're trying to support, you know, it's really important to support strong, independent media. They literally said strong independent media and then gave them like 600 million dollars which would make them totally not well, at the very same time stripping every small independent media right out of canada yeah i mean they There's constantly a lot of reject uh, right now, rebel news yeah and they reject uh you know true north and small independent they don't recognize them you saw them when they you know these small independent reporters uh, uh you know, they try and cover an event and they're just rejected. Well, we don't recognize you as media. And it's like, that's perfect. That's exactly who I want to report is someone who you don't recognize. Just someone yeah. with the calling and the profession to go and report what you said. Maybe ask you a question. So this, like to me, this is a problem and, and Trudeau's epitomizing the problem, which is 
you can't have a guy who already controls the entire government. Like he appoints the judges. He appoints the senators. He appoints all the bureaucrats. He's incredibly powerful in Canada. And he also controls not only the CBC directly, fully funds them, but now with payments to, you know, the other major media companies, they can know, they cannot claim to be independent. And I'll, t I'll challenge anyone who's been in business. When have you done a million dollars worth of business with someone and had no strings attached? Yeah. Exactly. That's impossible. Come <laughs> yeah. on. Like I used to, you know, do some business and I would meet with a client and I would buy them lunch and, you know, we'd spend a hundred bucks on lunch and then, you know what, I'd follow it up and I would, I would say, Hey, you know what? Like we can really, we can help you out. Like we, we're doing engineering work and, you know, give us a small project. Let us prove it. You know what? I, I'd win like a 10,000, $20,000 project. And it's like, awesome. And so, you know, I go back to my team, we do the project and then, you know, I, I take the guy out for lunch again, but this time maybe I actually take out him and his wife and, and maybe me and my wife take him out. You're yeah. developing a relationship over tens of thousands of dollars. And after years of building relationships, you're, you know, now we're, now we're maybe making a couple hundred thousand dollar projects, maybe a million dollar projects. There's no chance that you get a million dollar project without having some relationship. No, you're networking so you, and developing professional relationships. So when you think about the government yeah. making payments of hundreds of millions of dollars to these media companies, you think they just like write a check, they phone up like a 1-800 number and be like, hey, sh who should we make the check out for? Here's your $100 million. There's zero chance. There's like a huge network of relationships going on if there's $100 million being transferred. And so that is why it's not independent anymore. And so for me, the answer is, like try and get the best person voted in someone who's wise, right? Someone who has good policy ideas, but also just like cut the government down so it can do less damage. Get rid of the, get rid of the, the publicly funded inherently biased media because they can, the government can do less damage when they don't control the national broadcaster. That's just an example, right? Yep. Yeah. Cut cool. out more other bureaucracies. I like, do you know that you can buy raw milk in Washington and Idaho? Raw milk on pos you pasteurized? You can buy raw milk Ooh. in the grocery store. I had no idea. Yeah. And you know what? I, I went in, I saw the store, I saw someone buy it. They went out the door, they drank it, and then immediately died because it was raw milk. <laughs> what? In BC, people would die <laughs> if they drank oh, raw I milk. <laughs> The sidewalks were littered with people dead yeah. with like a jug of raw milk, just like glugging out glug, 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 on the street. <laughs> so our government is deeming raw milk elite. Like you can't buy or sell raw milk in BC. No. And yet no. you can. So somehow it's safe in Washington and Idaho, but it's incredibly unsafe in BC. You literally can't buy or sell raw milk. Meanwhile, how long did people drink raw milk? approximately forever yeah hundreds Literally of millions yeah. forever <laughs> you don't think there's like a safe way for people to buy and sell and consume raw milk like come on so that's just an example like somewhere there's a bureaucracy that we can cut out because i don't need to be protected from raw milk well <laughs> I mean, there's literally like I agree heroin. With what you're like saying, but drugs every, all over the streets. To accomplish what you're 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 talking about, though, the only way I I think is yep. is for what you want to do, which I'm on board. Yeah, you got to get involved into the system that's corrupt. You right. got to displace and permeate the system that is full yep. of the wrong people, and that's the only way to get through it. And I do believe smaller government. Yeah, I think we need a government of some kind, yep. but it has to be. Um, far smaller and in a way where you can't manipulate different facts. I get a kick out of some of the politicians I've talked to and they're all like, well, that's out of my purview. This is not right. my lane. Yeah, bullshit. Right. <laughs> yeah. Bullshit. Because you are rubbing elbows yeah. with all the right people. And mm -hmm. if you are such, if you are at the mercy of the system, yeah. then how come you're turning around and you're telling me I have to do something I don't want to yeah. end up doing? Yeah. Well, there's huge problems with the political system. And I think there's lots of different kinds of solutions out there. Some of them are interesting. I think the party system could be improved. Uh, like, I wish that MPs could just vote their conscience. I think there's zero chance that when all the liberals vote one way, that they actually all believe that 
for their constituents. Like, remember that an MP is supposed to like actually represent the people in their riding. Yeah. Like you're supposed Instead to vote for someone whip. who yeah. would carry your voice yeah. to the government. Not like the way our government works right now. It's it's crazy. You have one guy who's dictating to all his MPs and now his coalition MPs I w- to vote. I, I want to be a devil's advocate here. But now the bit. entire government is voting to support one guy's objectives. It's do you blame him? No, it's the system. You had, we, need a, we need a system you to work differently because of course used, he will do that to protect of himself. Course, for, I, I use Jody Wilson Raybould as an example, and yeah. nobody had her back. And then you hear a lot of people saying, "Well, there's nobody good in, in politics, right. and they're all corrupt, and I'm not going to vote because there's no yeah. good choice." Well, the same people that are scared of speaking out on day to day, everyday issues yeah. in in town because of you know, so they're going to be they're scared of you know backlash in one right. form or another. Well, imagine the magnitude when you're actually in a position you're supposed to represent your constituents in. Yeah. If you don't follow the party line and your constituents don't have your back, then it does, it disempowers your ability to be able to speak up and say anything. And, and the select few yeah. that are standing up now, I think, are starting to get a little bit of support because people are starting to say, OK, enough is enough. And, and that paradigm is starting to shift, but it's at the very... I think it's at the cusp of something and we can use different examples of people who who are trying to do this but they're putting themselves in the line of fire at the end of the day and that takes a a, a tremendous amount of um like that's a bravery that's that's a level of bravery because nobody even in day-to-day life is willing to do it they're scared of their job yeah so we need to support these people yeah yeah no absolutely and and my you know we can't just att- attack the people and the system like that's what you're saying we have to try and improve it we have to try and participate right and try and make improvements i guess what i'm saying is i'm acknowledging that there's a ton of ways that our system doesn't work very good and just the party system to me doesn't work very good there should be a better way i think it's rather complicated Mm -hmm. and and again that's why if i had to pick like next time i'm talking to pierre polyev um i'm gonna tell him like just tell all your ministers to tell all their bureaucracies to cut 10%. Just you cut 10% of time government. next time you're talking to Pierre Polyev. So is I, this a buddy? No, I, I think we're going to chat one time. I think he's going to be the next prime minister. I do too. And I hope 100%. we chat sometime. I'm hoping to chat at him one time myself too. I think a yeah. lot of people would like that opportunity. I know he was in uh, your neck of the woods there not that long ago. Yeah. And, and I sure would like to see him in... My neck of the woods here. Holy. I did go to meet him when he was running for um for leader. So that was like a year ago. Yeah. And honestly, this is the first political rally I've ever been in in my life. Uh, but like you said, like we felt uh, totally unheard for quite a while. And I was like, man, we just got to do something. I literally paid a, a membership. I joined the Conservative Party of Canada membership, gave him like $10. And became a, a member. So I'm like, I just have to do something. And I really feel like right now, uh, the existing government is the worst government I've seen in my lifetime. And I need to do something. And I, at the same time, I also like reduced my expectation. Like I had too much faith in the people, honestly. You know how people who get hurt <laughs> say they had too much faith? Like yeah, they- 100%. And, and so, uh, you know, I guess I was hurt. And I realized, you know what? I got too much faith in the people. Like, I can't just presume that they're looking out. They're actually, like, selflessly looking out for me and the rest of people. There are people who are super selfish and self-centered. Anyways, after all that, I'm like, I got to get involved. I got to do something. I can't just complain about it. I got to do something. I joined the party. I went to the rally for Pierre because he was speaking my language. I mean, he was saying defund the CBC. Yeah. He was like, uh, he was pretty common sense on the whole uh, vax mandate and the truckers. And he came out in, I would say, measured support, right? For yep, the truckers. 100%. Yeah, and it was good wording. Nice wording. Measured support, for sure. Yeah, it, which he also recently did with the whole, <clears throat> how do you say this? Uh, parental rights in education. He came out with measured support and said, hey, Parents raise kids, not the government. Yeah. And that's good enough for me. I support that. 
position. Anyways, we we met him, and <clears throat> you know what? The guy, unfortunately, politic politicians or politics weighs really heavily on personality and charisma. Yeah, and that's why Trudeau's in, right? He yeah, had the bloodline. 100%. He had the look, the charisma. Like apparently, I haven't met him, but you know, apparently, he could carry a room, which I totally get. Like he's a dynamic. Trudeau is. I guess. And by the way, John I've never seen was. it. I don't understand that. I, no, not I, now. Right from the beginning, though. Like when they first were, you know, remember the commercial? He's got nice hair. I'm like, I, what the? <laughs> this is a commercial. Like, so I, I, don't I believe get, I don't it. Like, it. I believe it. He had personality, right? Like character, and he's a tall, handsome guy. But right now, like I, I, maybe I'm getting older and wiser. I see through appearance a lot better. I see like the heart and soul of someone a lot better now than I did when I was younger. And he looks ugly to me. He looks yeah. like a scared, selfish man. Yeah. But anyways, what I was saying was he had <laughs> charisma. I believe yeah. that's what carried him. The name, the charisma. And you had like a very, very, very hurting liberal party at the time who was like desperate for a savior. And then you had, you know, Harper was in for 10 years. It was basically due for a change. There's the you know, a little thing about Mike Duffy and like 30 grand or something. And boom, you had, you got this guy coming to power. Anyways, I was going to say provincially, John Horgan, I listened to him once at the Northern uh, Resource Exhibition a few years ago when he was still premier. <clears throat> and I don't support anything that John Horgan supports in government. Like I, I just don't believe in the NDP's vision whatsoever. It's basically you know, like a socialist government. And I just don't believe it. I believe people need to be empowered, not not the government should not be taking the responsibility for people. You know what I mean? Build some roads, have yeah. a, build a military, protect the border. I've listened to but, some of these speeches too, and I'm shocked that why am I so concerned and alarmed at what they're talking about and everybody else is buying into it? And yeah. I look around and I'm like, what? What am I missing? What am I missing here with the speech? Yeah. Why are they buying into it? Because I'm looking at somebody that is like, we, we should, this is bad. This is so bad. I got two things to say, but let me finish what John Horgan. Sure. Uh, he was a, an amazing speaker in person. He was so natural. He was a great speaker. You felt like you were just having coffee with him, but he was speaking to, you know, 500 people or something. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I get it. People like, like this guy is, is, charismatic and i never saw it because again i just never believed in his policies from the beginning but you know if you're like a little wishy-washy like if you're open to believing this type of politics or that type like if you're not kind of predetermined i can see how you get wrapped up in like a charismatic leader and that's the thing it's like a double-edged sword because now you have pierre Polyet. well he's got all the charisma that guy is magic yeah like that guy carried a room it was packed it was like literally steamy we brought all the kids. I'm like, kids, it's time to learn about politics. Let's go to a rally. So we went down there. We met Pierre. He did the, he carried it for like an hour. There was huge cheers. Like people were cheering and clapping. These were like paid supporters, man. These were people that drove from an hour away from the outskirts of Prince George. And they were hoping for something and they got everything they were hoping for. The, Pierre's an amazing uh, personality. And he's a great speaker. He's obviously very eloquent and he's a quick, he's quick witted. Yeah, he's sharp. He can tell a joke. And so anyways, but the other thing he did was he hung around for like three hours. Wow. And we hung around for three hours, almost just to like have to see it, to believe it, that he would wait there that long and shake every single hand. And we went up and we waited wow. in line. We were at like the back cool. of the line and we shook hands and said hi to Pierre and... I forget if we gave him any uh, words of wisdom, but, but anyway, so we did meet him. And so, so regardless of whether people really buy into the small C conservative uh, policies that he's proposing, those people who just want to get behind like a winning leader are going to get behind him because he yeah. looks like a winner. He sounds like a winner. And he happened in this case, he's a winner who also carries my beliefs in like smaller government right like let parents raise their kids honestly parents have raised their kids from the beginning of time we don't the government is not suddenly better no no i agree i that actually that rally i remember that rally yeah it was there's certain things that uh happen where where i just i regret not 
making that extra effort and making it happen. But then sometimes I've been in the opposite situation where you make all the sacrifices and sometimes you don't think there's really any value on the end of it all. And yeah. you're like, what did I just do? Cause yeah. I just compromised a lot of different things to be able to make a certain route or do a certain thing. Yeah. Um, but that one was one that I really wish I would have gone to because I heard a lot about. Yeah. And we hung around <clears throat> like the, what do they call those? Are those roadies at like a concert? The people who like hang around. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that roadies? Yeah. I felt like we were like roadies. We were like helping pack up the chairs and stuff. <laughs> but I got a chance to uh, meet Bob Zimmer. <clears throat> and that's where we first met. And we had a long chat. And I was like, no way. This guy seems like a legit guy. Like he could be my neighbor. Yeah. And of course he is someone's neighbor up here. And that's where I found out he had guns. He had handguns. <laughs> and I'm like, you got handguns. I'm like, I got handguns, but like. Their government's taking them away. Yeah. We all shoot IPSC, me and three of the girls. And we got into it literally when Trudeau got elected. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy a handgun before he bans him. We did and the exact same thing. <laughs> exact identical and, thing. And I, I was <laughs> never into hand. Like I was never like one of those gun enthusiasts. Like we were just hunters. We yeah. literally shot a couple times a year to sight in our guns just to go hunting. And so I didn't even really get the whole shooting thing, especially the stuff you see on YouTube in the States where they're going crazy with automatics and stuff. But I thought, you know what? Actually, handguns are incredibly practical. They're actually so great that we've banned them. Because unfortunately, they're great at doing wicked things as great as they are at doing good things. Like if you were a hunter, a trapper, a guide outfitter, a prospector, a forester, if you're a, an off-grid homesteader what's the handiest thing to carry with you to defend yourself against a bear or to like shoot yourself a, a deer well it's a handgun because you can do all the other things and just yeah. have a gun on your hip it's and yet it can defense. protect you from a bear but that's and it can shoot i mean you can hunt with handguns you can shoot a deer with a handgun and if you're me out in the woods all the time, you would just carry it with you. Yeah. And just like, I got a hunting tag, a, a deer tag, and for three months, I can shoot a deer. And if I'm out there, I'm not going to pack a rifle all the time unless I'm really hunting. And you can't prospect with a rifle. Like, you're always like stooping over in the water, right? But you can carry a handgun. And where are the bears? Well, they're down at the rivers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right? And we're yeah. packing out, like we packed out that bison this year. And you know what? Like, I'm not scared of bears. Like, you know, there's way worse things out there, but like, I'm also kind of protective of my kids. Well, rifles are not particular. Like they're not designed for that purpose. Rifles are designed for long range. Bears don't attack from long range. They burst out of the willows 10 yards away. And within a second, they're on top of you. And that's where a handgun comes in handy. Cause it's handy. You can use one hand. Yeah. And yeah. you can kill a bear. It's it and hopefully just scare it off. But it boils it gets on back top down to the 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 reasoning for being able to do something is nonsensical. It's just the uh, vehicle to be able to enact a thing, and yeah. it's control at the end of the day. Yeah. And um, I don't believe guns. Look, guns aren't guns. Don't kill people. People kill people. Yeah. And there's a lot. When that's kind of what got me down that road too. Is when you start looking at the reason of a thing. Yeah. The only thing that ends up making sense at the end of the day, when you go down that rabbit hole, it's not always about money. It's about power because mm -hmm. with power, then you have money and control. And handguns is one of those things where you control. Well, you take that away from people, freedom yeah. of speech, everything that's starting to erode right now. Is yeah. a, and, and shout out to Zimmer. Uh, I'm glad you met. He's actually... The reason I want to touch on that too is because yeah. I originally touched on Kevin, but yeah. there was a follow up with Zimmer who kind of made made the connection between you and me. Okay, yeah. Remember, I don't know. He's right. Yeah. He's like, here you go. Because uh, I've been, I was trying to reach out and uh, you right. know enjoy some of your stuff, and then uh, I did a couple of podcasts with Zimmer, and yeah. I got to say, shout out to him. Here's a story not many people know about that speaks to his character. Yeah. Um. I first met Bob Zimmer and to be quite honest with you, I had a little bit of a bad, um, I guess, opinion of him mm -hmm. uh, just because of politics. He was a politician. I never seen him. And so I was like, ah, what the hell? Who is this guy? Yeah. So we went on, uh, I went to Ottawa for the Freedom Convoy. Yeah, It was something, it was one of those things where I was like, okay, I, that was a very stressful element anybody can relate to. Yeah. 
ended up going there, called him. And at that time, it was just a podcast with, with voice only. Yeah. And I had a hotel room. Yeah. And I made sure it was uh, not just two beds. It had like a little area where, with a chair and you mm-hmm. could sit down. And he went out of his schedule to sit down and, and I did a recording and it was freaking, it was amazing. We touched on stuff that people need to hear. Really? Well, I, being a dummy, I consider myself <laughs> to be fairly aware and do certain things yeah. to, while my phone rang. Oh yeah. And I hit the button right here for the computer. Oh, Don't no. touch that. Right. Because it went mute. I He left. We finished the recording. He ended up leaving. And uh, I went to go check it all out. And it was going, going, going. There was blank. And I'm like, exactly. So I called him. And I'm like, you're not going to believe this. Well, he said, okay, well, that's fine. We can redo it tomorrow. Are you available tomorrow? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so the recording wow. with him for the yeah. first time is the second recording the following day yeah. after I went and I messed up. Yeah. I was in Ottawa. Yeah. He was supporting yeah. the convoy yeah. publicly. Yeah. Uh, he was taking photo ops with some people from here that yeah. were up there yeah. involved. Burn Buker, by the way, shout out. He's in court right now, live okay. as we speak. He's fighting that in Ottawa. Is that Eagle Vision? Uh, ben or- Hab, yeah. He okay. did the documentary. Right. Um, but Burn Buchert was uh, one of the guys that was out there. He had the big truck. It says uh, Mandate Freedom. Oh, okay. Yeah. So good. he was on the podcast too a couple of times. Oh, okay. And uh, anyways, he was there right to the very end yeah. and he got arrested. So now he's, yeah. I think it was yesterday. He went uh, to Ottawa and he's in, in uh, court right now. Yeah. I think it's three days they kind of cut out and he's fighting that right now. Yeah. But anyways, Bob Zimmer went and did a photo op with him on that trailer and the whole right. nine yards. Uh, and he did the second recording yeah. and uh, he started talking about things that people need to know about when it comes to fisheries, when it comes to like how the government's working. Yeah. There's very few people that were willing to talk like that. Yeah. And, uh, and then the second, the second time we did a recording, he was sitting right where you are. Yeah. And he was very specific. Kevin, I only got an hour. Right. <laughs> you live out in the middle of freaking nowhere. I only got an hour. I right. said, okay, no problem. So we're sitting, and you'll hear this in the recording. Yeah, it's the first uh, video one was just single, single camera, and I'm looking at the time, and I'm like, oh, "Okay, we we got an hour, Bob." Yeah, <laughs> and he goes, "I'll tell you what, you just let me know when we gotta wrap it up." Yeah, and we got into Agenda Thirty by Thirty, and a lot of stuff that a lot of people, especially then, were yeah. air quote conspiracy theories. Yeah, well, when it's coming from an elected official. Yeah. Okay, there's teeth behind that. Yeah. And there's two and a half hours uh, of, I think, a lot of really good conversation. And my perspective of Zimmer and a lot, that's where I realized, look, there are some people in government yeah. that we need to support. Yeah. Hey, we need to get involved in a way because look at what they're, the, he went out of his way when yeah. his neck was really out there in a big yeah. way. And and you got to you gotta acknowledge that. Yeah. And, and I think you said it like, you could be totally disillusioned and say all oh, politicians are are crooked and and maybe even if they start off good they get corrupted by the system and there's probably a fair bit of truth to that i think our 100%. system it, yeah. is it it incentivizes the wrong thing a lot of times however there are still better people than some other people like oh, yeah. you still yeah. need to choose <laughs> you know you need to choose your person there's still better people and there's worse people right so like we got the at at minimum vote Maybe get involved. I know some people just like, you know, in their spirit, they just can't politic. And I think that's fine. If you just can't politic, then that's fine. Yeah. I think some people just don't. They, they can't. can't or whatever. And so yeah. I would not, you know, shame anyone. But I would just no. say, hey, if you're feeling, if your gut gets wrenched by this stuff, then just do something. Right. And... Hey, back to that, uh, we were talking about Horrigan, and you're like, how does anyone eat this stuff up? Oh, yeah, right. yeah. So <clears throat> I was remembering, uh, so Thomas Sowell, Not you know sure that guy, that Thomas Sowell, he's like 90, I think. He's written 100 books, um, and he's a conservative commentator, I guess you'd call him. Uh, I think he's fairly well-respected. I've heard him quoted, pa- Pierre quoted him like a year or two ago and and i remember reading like a comment on one of his videos being like i can't believe i just heard 
a, con- a Canadian conservative politician quoting Thomas Sowell. And so I'm like, who is this guy? So I looked him up. I actually follow him on the X now. Oh. I I don't think it's, it's not him, but it's Thomas Sowell quotes, I think, is the X account. And I think it's someone who's just like, hey, I'm just a super fan. And I quote stuff verbatim out of his books. Anyways, so I got onto Thomas Sowell. And, but he had this really interesting quote, which I think I saw on the X thing, was he said, the fact that politicians are lying all the time is a reflection on them, but it's also a reflection on us. It's because we want to hear a certain thing. We want to hear uh, that something can be the way we want it to be. And so when someone lies to us and says that that can happen, we believe it. Mm. Basically, politicians are just saying what we want to hear. And so we lap it up. But the only way to say it is to lie because it's not possible. Yeah. Right. This whole socialism thing, like the government can't make it better, but they will lie and say they're making it better. It's like this gun control thing. They're lying to say, hey, if we do these gun regulations, it's going to like have less gun crime, less murder, less violence. It's 100 percent untrue, but everyone wishes it was true. And so a politician so you, you can lie about it. think that's what the buy-in is when they're talking like that? When like, they lie, they're just saying what people want to hear. But why Why is it where, but that the element is what, like there's certain times like I've watched Trudeau or Horgan or some politicians yeah. talk and I'm like, man, this is like, and this is going to be extreme, but it's like I'm watching a pedophile yap to the freaking he's at a playground. It grinds me to and puts alarms off <clears> on <throat> such a level where I'm looking around. I'm like, why? Am I the only guy picking mm-hmm. up on this? It's a, such a level of craziness. It's like, how are people following for it? Yeah. Like, what the hell's happening? Am I the one who's off the mark? I don't know. And then I start it, questioning, like, am I really actually, what's going on here? Yeah. Am I seeing something that I shouldn't be? Or? Well, it's, I think the truth is hard and people don't like hearing it. And so you can just, build a career as a politician by just lying. And the other thing is, sometimes I think they believe their own lies. Like, sometimes I think they can sell them because they believe it, but I think it's still a lie. And You would have to after a while. I mean, if you're going to repeat it so everybody else believes you, there's got to be a certain amount that you start buying into it yourself. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. eh? (laughs) Yeah. What about this guy? So you said Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell. Is this him? Yeah. That's that's him there? Ah, I'm going to look into him. So anybody who uh, is looking at maybe on the audio part, Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, and then Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L. I'll look into that a little bit more. Yeah, Um, he's pretty amazing. He talks a lot about, like, his famous books, his most famous book is one of the first, I think, was um, Basic Economics. It's now in the fifth edition. And I just signed it out, actually. I'm going to listen. It's probably like 20 hours audiobook or something. But it's, so he's an, uh, um, an economist, but he touches on a lot of, like, American culture, especially race issues. So being a black academic conservative, he's a bit of a standout. And he really rejects a lot of the new notions of like racism and anti-racism. Uh, he's, he's been, he's rejected critical race theory, like from the beginning and, and the idea of uh, equity versus equality. Like these are one, these are like some of the tenets of what we would call like a woke, woke culture, right? They're and the just, precursors. Kind of just rejects them yeah, all. Precursors to a certain way of thinking like yeah, that. They're like pillars. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, you're into safety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> they use that life saving rules. Isn't it the... funny uh how there's certain uh coin phrases mm-hmm. that uh are just so signature. Actually uh I had to laugh when you texted me uh we were lining up the the recording time yeah. for this, and you went, "Oh, oh, that was uh, misinformation." Oh, I'm like, "Where else do you use that word?" Eh? Yeah. But I just started laughing. I over. never use it, which is why I'm like, "I'm going to use it just to see what what I get back." Uh, I I'll, hate it. It's it's so literally it's, like from a sci fi book. Misinformation, disinformation. They literally it, made like, up oh. a word that actually represents information we don't like, but they made a new word for it because information we don't like doesn't sell what they're trying to sell what they're trying to sell is we don't like it and it's bad well no it's not bad it's just information can't be good or bad right it's just information 
Like evidence. Evidence doesn't actually prove anything itself. No. Everything can be evidence. Anything that has carries information about a particular thing is evidence. When you look at the politics of things, like whether something happened or not, you can't say, oh, there's no evidence. It's like, yeah, there's evidence, but it might not be strong evidence. Yeah. And there might be one piece of evidence that show, you know, that supports one conclusion and 10 pieces that support. But as a society, please, let's respect the fact that you gather all available evidence and then you weigh it. Yeah. Right. And as hu humans, imperfect humans, whether you're a judge or a jury or whether you're just a guy on the street trying to make your own judgments, you weigh the balance of evidence. But let's not reject evidence or information. No, that's dangerous. Disinformation or misinformation. That is yeah. obviously purely narrative propaganda. It is. It's it, the general terminology. That's the other part that kind of throws the little radars for me out is when you have general terminology and when people like the misinformation, disinformation, what drove me wild and is safer to say it now than ever, but I couldn't, I just wanted to smack people when I heard them say it. <laughs> uh, well, it's science, follow the science. Oh, it's man. like, you know what? I am though. Yeah. Science has taken all the perspectives and this is where the alarm for me, this is one of the biggest alarms is when you would have follow the science and science is evolving through trial and error and uh, looking at different perspectives and trying to be able to forward, I think, something that you're working on. When it's uh, follow the science and this is what it is. And if you speak different to it, regardless of your understanding or anything, you fight the narrative, yeah. you're the problem. And I've seen that happen on where people are losing their jobs people if you speak different against air quote the science narrative it is like why are people going with this so easily because you've got people who are the jody wilson rabel sticking their neck out and they're being yeah you know they're losing their jobs and they're coming from a a, a very knowledgeable respectable position up to that point yeah and then all of a sudden crucify him i was like wow uh -huh. why what's going yeah. on here and science i consider myself scientific because the scientific process is one of skepticism you should have a theory but then you should try to you can't prove the theory all you can do is disprove essentially other theories and let one theory stand. Mm -hmm. So you have to be skeptical of what you know today if you want to learn a new thing tomorrow. You have to be skeptical. You have to be willing to test it. And your theory is essentially proven when you believe you've exhaustively tested the yeah. alternative. The best logical theories. sense. Yeah. But you should always recognize that your existing theory should and must always be susceptible to future skepticism and future well, yeah. challenge if, and eventually if you're not failure. you're called naive yeah well <laughs> like, like, like classical <laughs> physics lasted for hundreds of years and then it fell they had to abandon classical physics at least if you're into uh you know astronomy and a, um you know nuclear physics you had to realize like hey classical physics is very functional up to a certain point, like with everyday objects. But as soon as you're looking at stars or black holes or, uh, you know, atoms and subatomic particles, nuclear or classical physics stops working. Yeah. And now you need quantum physics. Yeah, exactly. But they yeah. had to disprove classical physics. They had to like, it held for hundreds of years. It enabled everything, all the advancement in hundreds of years. And in the early 1900s, it, they had to question it. They had to be skeptical that it was actually accurate at a subatomic level. And then they eventually proved that, no, in, indeed, not, it does not hold. It changes fast. I mean, uh, I remember when I was a kid, I was told, you know, passionately, dinosaurs never existed. That was just a myth. Right. Well, I think it's pretty common it's knowledge. because they're not in the Bible. They, right? <laughs> <laughs> you picked up on That's that. That's why. But hey, dinosaurs existed. It's pretty hard to prove it. It they didn't. Right. I mean, nowadays. So I mean, things. Well, they're do the change. best explanation for a lot of things we find, aren't they? 
There's a lot of absolutely. There's, there's, like, there's dinosaur tracks. There's, and there's dinosaur fossils. Bones. I mean, you know what's funny is kind of a big. I mean, that's a lot of proof right there. When I came <laughs> home from, I remember when I was a kid, my grandparents. This was actually '80s, so my parents were, would have lost the house because it was '80s. That whole that whole thing. And by the way, no one in my generation has experienced like an interest rate for real until maybe like right now. Yeah. But in 80, of course, the interest rates are like 18%. Like well, yeah, so, 18 to 20%. Yeah. So my parents, I was just ta talking to them recently. I was like, tell me exactly like, what happened. And he's like, yeah, they went to like 22%. Yeah. In in like a year or something. And he said when they, my dad, he 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 actually bought uh, like a lot and had a home built and and so he got like a construction mortgage for like a year or something. And so he had to renew that mortgage in like 81 or something. And yeah, I was like 22%. And they were like, not going to be able to do it. So my grandparents moved into the basement and they helped pay for the house for like, they, so they lived in the basement suite for, uh, you know, five, 10, I don't know how long, five years. Anyways, that's just like a little personal story about how people survived. But Anyways, I would come home from elementary school and my grandma would be home and I'd go down and I'd bring her the library books and I'd bring her like a dinosaur book. No, <laughs> not reading that. <laughs> <You know. laughs> not into dinosaurs. <laughs> the Bible didn't talk about dinosaurs. Uh, no, they didn't. Well, now they, they, I've asked that question a few times and uh, there's, well, you know, it did say, but it wasn't like, there's, there's a little bit of side. Oh, yeah, anyways, well, the Bible it wasn't it supposed to be an exhaustive geological record. Well, no, but why, why, uh, why, why, why is that only book that was written so far back the only thing, the point of reference that we hold in such high value? How come we don't have anything now well, that we but, can use as a? But you know why? There is a there is like an inherent conflict I think that people are sensitive about, and that is. <clears throat> and that is really like the creation evolution discussion. Mm, yeah. If you're, if you, if you believe in evolution, the theory requires a very long time, right? And if you believe in creation, creation does not require. Some people who believe in creation believe in like a very sh short history. Yeah. A uh, very young, yeah, twenty five hundred years or whatever, and and so and and some people who believe in creation don't care. They're like, I don't care if it's a billion years old. Like they don't care. But the evolution has to be very old. Like that's the theory how how that works. So I think that this came about because people who believed in creation saw like a creeping logic with the whole age of the earth and the dinosaurs basically supporting the evolution theory, which of course, going back to our earlier topic, like you don't want your kids, you want your kids, if you're a Christian, you believe in creation, you yeah. want your kids, you're going to teach your kids. 100%. And, and you yeah, know, you I see what you're saying. You, you should, and, and you should, whatever your highest belief is that you should pass that on to your kids. It's what you think is the best for you. And you, obviously you would pass it on to your kids. So I don't blame anyone, but I, I think that was a threat, you know, coming from a public school, they bring home dinosaur books that talk about like the earth being a billion years old. And they're like, wait, is this, is the next book going to be about how in those billions of years, all this stuff evolved? Because yeah, the argument of them, them not being in that, I said that kind of jokingly, because some people try to find dinosaurs in the Bible. Yeah. And I think I've heard, oh yeah, there's like some references, but I, my opinion is like, Hey, I think the Bible is like, a fabulous book. It's like actually an amazing book. It's, it's so old. It has so much it, stuff in it. Hundred percent. I believe yeah. there's like incredible wisdom in the Bible, um, but it's not a. It's not supposed to be like an exhaustive historical or geological record. So you can't say that because it's not in the Bible, it didn't happen. Which is yeah, unfortunately, sometimes an argument. When it comes to, I did an episode with my dad, uh, and I feel bad. Oh. So my apologies. No, it was good. In the way where he had, I think, the ultimate parental patience, because yeah. I have a, a, an undying a level of respect when it comes to uh, all of that stuff, all the all, not just one specific religion, but yeah. religions. It, it, Muslim, it doesn't matter what it is, okay? I have a, a level of respect for it. I just don't have a real founded understanding about any one of them. Mm -hmm. 
which results in endless questions that I would rather have, you know, I tried to talk, my dad is very knowledgeable in all of that. So mm -hmm. I was hitting him with one question after another and it wasn't a, a attack. Right. It really wasn't. Yeah. I just have so many questions that I can't really buy into any one of them. Yeah. Although having said that, I don't consider myself an atheist yeah. because there is like, I know there's so much more to everything. Who am I to think that I have it figured out, whether it's evolution, whether there's, look, there are things out there and happening and the universe is such a great big thing that there's way more than like, I think we're just getting to a level of we're starting to realize how freaking stupid we really are. Yeah. There's so much out there. So to say, well, you know, I'm, there's no such thing in one or the other, uh, you know, that's not a very good argument. Uh, so unless you're talking about the earth being flat where I right. probably will push back. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you no, know, there's, I, I don't mean to cut it short, but no. there's a few things here that, uh, we got to wrap things up yeah. and there's a few little things I wanted to kind of end on fun, fun yeah. question kind of thing. Um, this is weird because I'm usually the one to push the episodes longer and longer. Now <laughs> I'm the one. <laughs> yeah. You met your match, man. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Door is open. We yeah. should set a whole day aside one day. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I put some some things here that were kind of neat. Um, what is your favorite episode or one of? Like maybe a, it doesn't have to be specific. Maybe a couple little experiences or one episode you think is one of the Like on our ones. channel? Yeah, Grid Listeners YouTube channel. <clears throat> one of our... Okay, so nothing jumped into my mind, like, on the top of my head. But one of the reasons we even started making these videos was just to, like, share with friends and family what we were up to. But also, like, my granddad wrote a little book when he was old, and my sister helped type it out for him. And so he, he, gave, he we got a book. And it just, like, kind of outlines his life. And it's awesome. We, like, look back at it all the time. Like, how did they do that? And I was just rereading that little bit where they were homesteading and they were, you know, they were, they, they made, they got by on two, two milk cows. They sold the cream from two milk cows and supported themselves when they first started homesteading. Anyways, I love that idea. And I'm like, I want to write a book, except I don't actually want to write a book. I want to make videos, but I want it to have the same effect. I want to be able to look back. Yeah. And so, man, when we look back at videos I mean, it's only been like maybe seven years, but man, have the kids changed in seven years. Like when we moved to this property, our youngest uh, was two and like <laughs> the oldest was, I think, nine. And so, man, looking back at us building our little cabin with the kids being tiny little kids, like they're basically toddlers. I love that. And it's only going to get better yeah. as the as we go because in 10 years we're going to be able to look back and those kids are all going to have their own kids and their their kids are going to be watching videos it's an heirloom. about them yeah, yeah it is this an is heirloom a, this it's is our book right absolutely it's super cool so i love just looking back in time and seeing it's mostly about obviously the the, the people yeah. right because we got we got videos with friends in there that, you know, it's immortalized, right? It is. Absolutely. That that was something I was going to, I was curious about earlier that I thought, so the unscripted part is where we could talk about whatever. And yeah. it's awesome that we had this conversation. You're the, the coolest person to talk to, but I was curious about that too. I had as material as a reference point when it came to recording and capturing those memories and some of the people that were involved and it's crazy. So, okay, we'll move on to... Well, I had misinformation, uh, disinformation on here. <laughs> I think we did that. <laughs> um, so one of the coin phrases, I, I've i noticed that uh, a few times yeah. you, you'll you'll reference something where you're you're learning about something and and you'll make a big point of going and and you you can do this. Yeah. Right. And, and you're trying to make sure that you're elaborating the fact that we just figured this out. Yeah. And, you know, this is so tangible that you can do this also. Uh that's something that seems to have taken because I just devote almost every video I've seen you uh, make or I've, I've watched, sorry. Yeah. You bring that up and you can do this. It's, it's, it should, it should almost be a coin phrase, but right. why does that seem to resonate with you so much? 
I don't know, and I don't say that religiously in all the videos, but I no, but it, it's often. it comes up like organically. Yeah, often it does. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to encourage people. You know how it goes, like when you've like you think you've found the way, and you're like, "Come on, guys! Like I found the way. Like <laughs> yeah. this is the way." Yeah. and that's what I'm trying to tell people. Is like, man, I used to commute in Vancouver, and it was terrible. Like I questioned all my life choices. I'm like, why am I here? I'm like, I'm like, twenty. And I'm spending three hours a day on the highway. Like, stab me in the face, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I was, you know, I looked at a future. I went to BCIT. And so I was commuting in and out of BCIT. And I, you know, and I, I love tech stuff. I was like, man, I'm going to work on like spaceships or something. And so I started applying to high tech companies. And I'm like, wait, I'm applying to high tech companies in Burnaby. I'm like, that would mean I would work in Burnaby. And I can't afford to live there. And I don't want to live there so i'd live as far away as possible but then i would commute for three hours and this would be my life yeah and i mean there was a lot of things i always loved the outdoors i always wanted space i wanted to build my own house and so i wanted to get out and i just want to encourage other people i'm like i did it i lived in the suburbs i didn't have these skills like i did not grow up you know milking cows or building houses or you know, fixing my own vehicles or whatever, whatever it is we do. Uh, but yeah, you can learn this stuff. That's why I said it's like the golden age of off-grid homesteading. It's like you can do it. The information's out there. And our channel is not a resource channel. Like we are not step-by-stepping anyone. But I feel what we are trying to do is encourage people. Like you, you, you're watching us do this for the first time. And it's pretty darn successful. Like Rose this year just started making cheese. Like she'd done it before a little bit, tiny bit, maybe once or twice. But this year we got the milking cow for the first time. Oh. And so, man, she's like, she hasn't had one wrecked cheese. Like we've eaten every cheese. Now she's only going to get better. Like we could do this for 50 more years and she could be like, you know, one of those old ladies, <laughs> yeah. crap, you know, and, and people were like, how do you make that cheese? And, you know, she's been making it for her whole life. But right now she's just starting, but it's, it's so rewarding and exciting to like make your own delicious food. Even if it's not delicious the first time, it's still edible and it won't be long and it'll be delicious. Just like the bacon we make is we had the, our homemade bacon this morning. Mm. Man, if you want to feel like, like a big deal, yeah. <laughs> raise your own pig, uh, slaughter yeah, it, butcher it, exactly. cure the bacon, smoke the For bacon, sure. fry the bacon with your friends. And you're like, I don't want to, brag here like <laughs> i'm a bit of a big deal absolutely yeah absolutely well and your um what's that sausage that you made out of the uh, smokies bear and um and it's 60 bear and 40 percent uh pig yeah the jalapeno cheddar smoke yeah i got hungry watching that well the, <laughs> the, the thing so is good. everyone's got to eat right like these are so good these are valuable skills like learn how to make your own food man yeah it's practical and it's rewarding. You literally eat your product. Yeah. Right. And so I don't know. I'm encouraging people like I think you should get reconnected with nature. It's like it's like it teaches you things. It can heal you like sunshine, like stare at a tree for a long time. And think like how in the world? Like if you want to believe in creation, stare at a tree. Yeah. Like how complicated is a tree? It's like way more complicated than you think. It's got all sorts of, and then it exists with like the environment and the ecosystem. And you're like, this is complicated. Like nature has things to teach us. And then raise your own food and see how hard it is. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. See how valuable that is. Like, man, we do not waste a piece of pig. And even though our skills are growing, like we're trying to waste less and less. This year, for the first time, uh, we we tried to use some of the skin of the pig. We made crackle. We made no, uh, not the chicharrones or the cracklings. Oh, we made, okay. but we rendered it into jello, gelatin. Oh, I seen that. Yeah, we just did that this fall. And yeah. I, so we're, we're learning new things, but I've it's all about that. like trying to utilize the whole pig because we know yeah. how costly and how much work and how valuable the animal is. We're trying to utilize it as best as possible. Finish everything on their plate. Yeah, or do they throw food away? No. No, there's not. No, and 
Because I only ask that because that drives me insane know, eh? where everybody just eats half of their plate and then they throw the rest away. And I'm the opposite. Of, 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 you know, I'm not growing everything, right. but I'm the guy who has to go to work. And, yeah, actually, and right. I'm like, that was 40 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was five in the morning. Yeah getting up to go to work that was the hard part that you just threw away like that 40 dollars was me getting up in the morning like oh it just and now i'm like wait a minute son of a bitch i saw him like that yeah (laughs) yeah i think the girls definitely have a a a very unique appreciation yeah for that connection that connection okay so one more thing i'm gonna ask you and then we're wrapping Mm -hmm. it up um so it comes to um acknowledging fans you know because there's a lot i think you have quite a following over quite a period of time um how do you there's a lot of people that reach out and want to show a a level of appreciation for what you do and there's i think over a period of time a connection that's built that must how does that affect you i'm sure you probably have experiences and stories but how do you acknowledge i think those people that you know are reaching out and you want to make sure that connection yeah is is kept or Acknowledge. So we, yeah, we went through like a whole, what do you call, like a whole, a whole like array of experiences. When we first started putting stuff on YouTube, like I had no interest in social media. I still have zero interest in social media. If I could hire someone to do all that and I could just live in the woods, I would. Uh, but for the first couple of years, like we didn't care about, we just put the videos up and the comments like were like, who are these weirdos, right? And then we actually had some bad experiences because we had a couple of our hunting videos. I mean, they they ended up with like a couple million views. And so we suddenly got this like massive uh, amount of attention and comments. But a lot of it was like wicked, hateful comments that literally oh, really? told us to die. Like, really? I hope you die. Oh, wow. And I'm like, that's weird. Like, I get, yeah. like, if you want to be a vegetarian or something, but like, if you think I should die, wouldn't that kind of, Like, isn't that kind of the same as like an animal dying or like hopefully (laughs) anyways, they didn't like us killing animals. And so we actually got like, yeah, some terrible comments, which, and the kids were quite young. Uh, We had, we had threats. We, we phoned the police because they were like, oh, we're going to, we can, we're going to track you down and kill you. Whoa. And we're like that. You can't threaten to kill us. Can you like, is that legal? And of course you contact the police. You're like, can you do anything? They're like, no. Really? <laughs> yeah, they're like it's on. So you don't inter- know how legitimate, you know, a, a comment like that is. Yeah, there's no, and there's, but there's zero place for that. Like, you know, but the technology's not there for the police to do anything about it. They don't know. They, they can't like it. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. so so that period kind of really soured us for a while. <clears throat> but slowly, since then, um, we yeah we really started to notice, like the same people commenting. I'm like, okay. And we start to reply. And then you actually build like a little bit of a repertoire and you don't really know these people, but you get to know them a little bit. You know, some people would constantly write, like they would devote like a long comment and they would tell a story. Yeah. And I'm like, these people are like sitting somewhere and I like never comment on YouTube video. Like I didn't even watch YouTube. I just put videos out there. And so it was a long, it was years before we really started engaging with people. Um, but then, and we did talk to some other YouTubers who actually encouraged us. They're like, oh, we have actually done like, like a get together, like a meetup or whatever. And they're like, they, we met some like great oh, wow. people. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. Cause we're trying to like, I'm trying to like protect my girls from these psychos on the internet. Yeah. And so they had a different situation. They were in like in a city, they could meet in this random place. And, but it did make me think, I'm like, yeah, you know what? These are good people. Like we've been engaging with people. And so, and in the same time, the girls have been getting older and I need to be less protective of them. Right. So I get where your concerns coming from. Yeah. 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 And, and so anyways, I I just feel way more secure about where the girls are at and they don't, they personally don't engage with any of the comments. Like it's all me and Rose and we'll pass along though. If you ever leave an encouraging comment, we always pass those on to the girls, but they don't like access this and read it on their own. A filter it. You're just going to filter it. Yeah. yeah. And it's not their thing. Like, I don't want to, you know, this was my choice to make the videos and I'm glad they participate because it's like enabled us to share a thing. But anyway, so back to the, so what I've realized just recently though, like a year and a half ago, we did the first kind of meetup. We did a camp out. 
So we charged people and we advertised it. We're like, come to the woods with us. <laughs> So what's yeah. funny is now they're like, these wait guys a minute, hey? psychos? You like, it. if we go to the woods, will we come back? Yeah. And of course, we're thinking the same kind of thing, like who's going to show up? Yeah. But I think that's why we made it a paid thing. We kind of put a paid wall and lots of people like so the main request always through time has been like, can we come see your homestead? And it's like, well, no, this is like our private yeah. like little place in the woods. But we did this camp out in the woods where we went to the woods together and like we built a little camp and we camped and you know what the people were fabulous they were really interesting people and they just wanted to meet people who had similar ideas they wanted to see in real life that like a family a normal family could just live such an abnormal life but in their opinion of the life they wanted right a yeah. slower down uh, or like you know a slower lifestyle out in the woods, like self-employment, like not full-time, like a family, like really engaged. And so they came out and I think they got what they paid for. And so we did it again this last year. And again, we met great people. And so it's like, yeah, there's actually, I've realized like there's actually a community of people around the world who I want to connect with. Yeah, because absolutely. <clears throat> this whole idea of like going way back to that self-sufficiency thing, like you can't be self-sufficient by yourself. It's crazy. You'd have to be a caveman. But you can be very sufficient, self-sufficient with a community. And you can rely on community. Like, I want to rely on community instead of like a grid supplied energy or food. I want to be reliant on neighbors who are skillful. Right. And yeah. that's maybe our most recent goal. It's like, we want to be part of a community and, and let's help encourage other people online. Let's have an online community of people who can like at least encourage and share information. And then hopefully, you know, <clears throat> we can have more people doing the same thing in the same general region, you know, little autonomous families, but that are friends and neighbors who can help each other and start networking and yeah. creating a bit of a community and, and with, with resources that aren't are a little bit more remote. And Northern BC would be perfect. Like yeah. there's so much land here. Yeah. Like people in the States, people in Europe, like there's no land. No. no. Not compared to here. And so here you can buy like big chunks of land and it's relatively reasonable. And you know what? There's resources, there's water, there's timber, there's animals to hunt. So this place could be like an off-grid Mecca. Yeah, it could be. Well, and it is. I've, I've met a lot of people up here that are um, definitely shifting into that direction. Yeah. Uh, like I was saying earlier with the whole move thing, um, there are other, I guess, similar kind of similarity um, little communities like with the Hutterites. Yeah. Um, the Russians have a few different colonies that have grown and then fractured or not fractured, but kind of started their own. Yeah. Uh, up here, um, just because it's all of the, the same, I think, um, reasonings are right across the board. It's just different, I think, face, I think, that have, right. have been the foundation of it all. But the the weird thing about it is it's all started within a very small period of time. Like, right. all of this happened within five years. Right. Maybe six. But it's interesting because they flourished, and up here especially, a lot of people are... I mean, you you said it's possible up here. There's a shift. There's a movement going yeah. on right now that up here that I'm feeling just because I guess I'm in the area, so I'm a little bit right. more aware of it. But oh man, yeah, there's a lot of people that are. Uh, there's a paradigm shift right now. Something big seems to be going on. Well, right now. we seek to be like strong and smart and skilled and free to explore and learn, like. We believe we can be like powerful people. You know what I mean? Like, like people who Im who can improve things, like make a positive yeah. change on a community and on a landscape. Like, like empowered people. I've we've taught the girls. Like you can, and not in like a not in like a feminist way where it's like you know you're a woman and you can like outcompete the men. Yeah. But what I'm meaning is just as a human, uh, like you need to take on risks. Yeah. Responsibilities and then overcome them. Yes. And and yeah. really that's not our society right now. Our society is very like tame. It is. It's very like, don't take a <laughs> risk because you got to pay the mortgage. So you got to keep this job, Absolutely. even though you don't like it. And it's very, very Measured, controlled for sure. And it's like, you're part of a machine. Everyone knows we're just part of a machine typically. And we've broken out, man. Like I say, 
we're off grid because the grid can't contain us. Yeah. Like we got ideas. It's on we your website, actually. Stuff. We got. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> we got to build things and try things and invent yeah. things. And I love it. I love it. Okay, a couple more things, and then we should wrap it up. I just I I do have obligations here. <laughs> um, here's a hat, and it's a gridlessness hat, and I've got a sharpie here. Okay. Can I get you to sign this, yeah. and then I'm gonna I'm gonna give this away, and I'm, I I want to brainstorm what the options are with this. I was I was just thinking anybody who shares this episode, and then tags me and you. Yeah. The first person to do that. Uh, gets I'll mail that hat. That's that signed to them. Yeah. There you go. Show the camera. Perfect. Love it. All right. Well, Jeff, it was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. I appreciate. Uh, man, this is a blast. I can keep yeah. going on forever and ever. <laughs> it, but uh, you know, I hope to be able to uh, stay in touch. And next time you're in the area again, uh, or even if I'm in down in your area, I'll, I'll swing by and say hi at the very least. Yeah. And thanks for doing this. Like, thanks for starting a podcast and trying to like get discussion and opinions in the air in no. a time where a lot of discussion and opinions have been shut down. Like this is necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree. And, and I love it. I'm in it for the long haul. I've had my moments where I'm like, do you know what? That's hell with it. But yeah, I appreciate it. It's comments like what you gave that make it all worth it. And I, I can, I give you my word. It's going to be going on for quite some time. Awesome. All right, guys. Take Thanks, care. Man. And uh, you can do this too. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs>